Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, thank you for coming here this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Nikhil Swami, who was with us uh, for two summers in the Cambridge lab. And today he's going to talk to us about his uh, dissertation work, uh, which focuses on uh, using language-based techniques to secure distributed web applications. So, Nikhil, please. Thanks, Ben. So, um, so my research has generally addressed various aspects of software quality. Recently, I've been focusing on security for web applications. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about security for a particular kind of web 2.0 application. Uh, this kind of application is fairly common, and the logos I have up here are from some of the most popular sites on the web. But uh, to be clear, what the kind of application I'm talking about is uh, are applications in which users provide content, and this content is then shared among other users via the website. Now, uh, you don't think of these applications as enforcing particularly strong kinds of security policies. So for instance, on Wikipedia, most applications, most pages are uh, publicly viewable, publicly editable, but there are some pages that have simple kinds of access control policies on them. But um, these kinds of web-based information sharing applications are also being used in, in, in organizations where information sharing is, uh, where security is a, is a really top priority. So for instance, there's this application called Intellipedia which is Wikipedia in the CIA. And it's based on free software from, 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 uh, from uh, Wikimedia. It's, the same, it's pretty much the same program. And it has about 3,600 users from uh, all 16 uh, US intel agencies. And the goal is to promote uh, sharing of information across the, uh, the entire organization. Uh, but the tools they use are pretty primitive. So for instance, this Sean Dennehy is, is the person at the CIA responsible for Intellipedia, and he says that uh, the tools they use are in their Model T stage. So there are many ways in which you could imagine these things being improved. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is, is how you can make these applications more secure. So can you construct them in a way that allows you to prove that they correctly enforce security policies? So to that end, I have three main contributions. The first is a new language called SE Links, or Security Enhanced Links targets multi-tiered web applications and allows you to enforce user-defined security policies end-to-end. -end. I formalized the core of this language in a, in a framework, in a, in a calculus called Fable, which is a system F with labels. And I proved the sound. Uh, I've showed that Fable is, is quite expressive, that you can use it to encode a wide range of user-defined policies. And uh, it allows you to prove that the encodings are correct, that they satisfy certain high-level security goals. Uh, we have some application experience. Our, our, uh, currently, our, our, our biggest application is, is something called SE Wiki that you could think of as a prototype of a next generation Intellipedia. And we have some other applications as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is first tell you a little bit, uh, very, very little bit, how, how Intellipedia works today. And then tell you about how we'd like it to work. And then uh, spend the bulk of the talk telling you about how we actually went out and built this thing. So, Intellipedia is not actually one application. There are multiple applications. So uh, in, the, in the military, there are actually separate networks that are classified to handle data of different classification levels. So there's a top secret network and a secret network, and they're completely separate. And there's an Intellipedia that runs in the top secret network and one that runs in the secret network. And documents in the top secret network can then point to documents in the secret network, but not vice versa. Users with the appropriate clearance level can log into each network. A uh, top secret user gets the top secret documents, the secret user gets the secret documents, and as you might expect, the secret user can't log into the top secret network and, and get those documents. But somewhat counterintuitively, a top secret user can't also directly log in here. He can't follow hyperlinks. His session at the top secret Intellipedia is not the same as the session at the secret Intellipedia. He has to log, in, log out, log in separately through a separate network and so on. So this is clearly less than optimal. Uh, uh, but, and the question is, why do they actually do it this way? So, um, uh, and there, there are many reasons, perhaps, but the one that I think is, is most 
significant is that there isn't a way of constructing an application today that is that can be trusted to handle data of multiple classification levels and um, and prove that it that it doesn't inadvertently leak information. So yeah. Of the top secret to the secret ones. Yeah. But you, they can't follow these links? They can't follow. Why do they have those? So the, the links are there because presumably it, it gives an indication to the user that they could, uh, that there is some information out there that they could then log out and go fetch it from somewhere else. Uh, so uh, this also leads to other kinds of problems. This isolation between top secret and secret is not a uh, is not set in stone. So you typically have top secret data that has to be declassified and downgraded. And right now, that's a pretty much manual process. There's a release officer that looks at these documents, scrubs out pieces of it, copies it into the, next, into the lower classification level network. And this leads to all kinds of other problems. So now you have multiple versions of the same document, and you don't know if, you know, if it's difficult to keep them in sync and so on. So um, what we'd like to do instead is to, is to have a more fine-grained structure for for security policies in the system. So first of all, we want to have a, a single application that's, that's clear to handle top secret and secret documents. And uh, uh, this, by the way, gets rid of this problem. Users can follow links and, and interact with the same application. Uh, we also want to have more fine-grained sharing. So instead of having s documents at different classification levels, fragments of documents could be at different classification levels. And the application has to filter out the, the appropriate part of the, of, of, the, uh, of the document before serving it to the secret user, but the top secret user gets to see the whole thing. Uh, now, there are other kinds of security policies that we might also want to enforce in a system like this. So accurately tracking provenance information, uh, making sure that downgrading, downgrades are performed correctly, uh, ensuring that crypto protocols are used properly. But in this talk, I'm really just going to focus on this, this access control framework. There's one other thing that I'd like to talk about, though, which is in this web setting, there are some web-specific th threats that we have to take care of. So in particular, there's the things like cross-site scripting attacks. So uh, these are really common, and uh, this kind of web 2.0 application is particularly susceptible to it. And they're hard to defend against, and they're dangerous too. So whatever solution we come up with must be able to protect against uh, things like cross-site scripting attacks too. OK, so now that we have these, these security requirements, uh, we want to go out and build software that actually uh, implements these security policies correctly. So uh, typically, security enforcement mechanisms are, 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 often not implemented are, are often not implemented correctly. So things like access control bypasses or error handling code inadvertently leaks messages and error messages, leaks information in error messages and so on. So uh, one solution is to use language-based techniques to ensure that uh, we have proper enforcement. So we either have custom languages or program analyses that ensure that you uh, actually implement a security policy correctly. But the problem with this is that they typically specialize towards a certain kind of policy. So you might have an analysis that tracks tainting, or you might ensure that uh, access control is done correctly. And what we want instead is a more general framework. We want a, a language for expressing security policies and their enforcement that satisfies three goals. So first, we want to ensure that the policy enforcement mechanism cannot be circumvented. The second is that given a security policy and its enforcement mechanism, we want to be able to prove that certain high-level security goals are satisfied, that, uh, that say, Alice never learns Bob's data. And uh, third, we want all this to be fairly modular. So if you want to enforce an access control, a provenance, and an information flow policy all in the same application, this framework should, be allow, should allow you to do all that, even though these have mul multiple different sorts of concerns. So towards that end, I have four contributions. The first is security enhanced links. And like I mentioned, SE Links is uh, a language for enforcing uh, security policies in a multi tier web application. It's an extension of the Links programming language, which is developed at Edinburgh by Phil Wadler's group. And the extensions to Links are essentially two main components there's a, a new type checker to ensure that security policies are properly enforced, and it's a new code generator that allows SE Links code to be compiled to. Uh, to store procedures that can run the database that allow you to enforce cross-tier policies. The second is uh, the fo uh, formalism of SE Links called Fable. Uh, we proved it sound, and we showed that it's, that it's fairly expressive. So we have encodings of access control policies in multiple styles. We have provenance policies, information flow controls, which are both static and dynamic. Uh, 
Uh, we can show that it can enforce stack inspection policies and security automaton-based policies. The last one is, is particularly interesting because there are some results that show that once you can reliably enforce automaton policies, then there's a wide class of safety properties that you can enforce. And uh, for each of these encodings, we, we proved useful properties about them. The third key result is this technique we call browser-enforced embedded policies, or BEEP. And uh, BEEP is particularly interesting in this context because it leverages c collaboration between client and server to uh, address cross-site scripting attacks. So we have uh, a customized a set of, uh, we've customized a few web browsers to allow this collaboration to take place. And uh, uh, Beep can be used to perfectly detect all XSS attacks with this collaboration. And our SE Links compiler produces Beep enabled code. Sure, um, I'll describe it more in detail later, but, but in short, um, uh, what it is is that a, um, uh, a, a users can attack each other's browsers by inserting JavaScript that can steal authentication tokens from another browser or, or other kinds of things as well. Can maybe have JavaScript worms that replicate. Uh, so but I'll, I'll give you a detailed example of how this works, but uh, the short answer is that browsers at, so users attack each other via the browser. So I'm trying to understand the motivation of the war. Supposing cross-site scripting attacks did not exist. Yeah. So would you, is there still some reason for doing whatever you're doing? Uh, for doing Beep? Yes, for doing Beep and your, all your... Oh, the others are not necessarily uh, cross-site scripting specific. Beep is the one that addresses cross-site scripting. I see. So the other techniques could be used in contexts which are not web specific at all. I see. General information flow. General information flow, stack inspection, uh, uh, access control. You could use it in, in any context, really. But to get it to work in, a, in, the, in the web context, we must be able to address cross-site scripting, and that's where Beep comes in. And so uh, the, the final contribution is, is application experience. We have this SE Wiki application. It's about 3,500 lines of SE Links code, and it enforces three kinds of policies in a, in a, in a um, uh, compositional way. So first, there's a, a fine-grained access control that, I, that I've been talking about. Uh, there's also provenance tracking, and there's an interesting uh, cross-tier stack inspection policy that I'll try to describe briefly later. Uh, we've also uh, developed an e-commerce application. We've actually ported it from Lynx to show that uh, SE Lynx is not just targeted towards these Web 2.0 applications. You can also build more traditional web applications in it as well. Okay, so um, the kind of application that I'm talking about, just uh, which is probably quite familiar to most of you, is, is three-tiered web applications in which there's JavaScript that runs in the client, there's uh, code that runs in the server that's say j2ee.net, PHP, something like that, and the client and server communicate via, say, posting HTML forms or AJAX and so on. The server and the database uh, communicate via, say, JDBC or uh, send uh, by having SQL queries that appear here that are then communicated to the database. Now, programming these applications are uh, can be tricky because there's multiple languages and these non-standard interfaces between them. And um, analyzing them is also difficult because of this. So here's where Lynx comes in. So Lynx is a, a, a multi-tier web programming language. Um, and the way Lynx works is like this. There's you write a single Lynx program, and the compiler, Lynx compiler and interpreter, there, there are declarations in the Lynx program that say this code is supposed to run in the client or this code is supposed to run in the, in the database. And the compiler then, then compiles part of it to JavaScript, part of it is interpreted at the server, and uh, SQL queries that are Im embedded in links are compiled to SQL. And now the interface between the tiers is not, instead of HTML forms and so on, it's just function call and return. So it's, a, it's a easier, for us it's important because this is easier to analyze uh, the entire application. So SE links has two main components. So there's a new type system that allows you to enforce user-defined policies. And the way this works is that there's some high-level policy that you want to enforce in software. So uh, the, an expert writes an enforcement policy which, which maps high-level security concepts to program operations, things like uh, how the policy should be enforced when functions are applied and so on. And then the type checker ensures that the program is consistent with this enforcement policy, that all program operations are consistent with this specification. 
The second thing is this new code generator, which compiles enforcement policy code to store procedures that are in the database. And uh, database queries then include calls to these stored procedures to ensure that uh, uh, to ensure that the same policy is enforced both in the server and the database. So here's how, an, uh, at, at a high level, how a user-defined policy is enforced in SE Links. There are three steps to it. There's uh, first, a security policy is specified by associating program data and actions with, with customizable security labels. Now, these security labels are just program expressions. The user gets to pick what these, are, what these expressions are. Uh, the semantics of these expressions are not baked into the type system. So uh, to specify the semantics of these labels, there's a special part of the program called an enforcement policy that defines how labeled data is allowed to be used. And these labeled data, or these protected values, can only be constructed and destructed in a manner consistent with this enforcement policy. So what I'm going to do now is, is to show you how a simple access control policy can be encoded in SE links. So the first thing you do is to specify a language of security labels. So you could have labels like high or low and so on to specify confidentiality levels. The next thing you do is to protect data by uh, allowing a label to appear in its type. Uh, so, for instance, int x is unprotected data. It's just a, its type is int. It contains no label. It can be used in any way by the application. Y, on the other hand, has a label L in it that defines how, it's, uh, how it should be used. It, that's, it's protected, and L defines how it should be used. These labels can be arbitrary, so you could, the uh, policy designer could pick access control list with two usernames in it, for instance. And in general, this does not just have to be a value. The labels are not values. They can be expressions. So uh, data with a protected type is, uh, has a type that looks like this, a T with an E in curly brackets, where E defines the security policy. Yeah? Can you say expression? What exactly do you mean? Is it like a verb brand universe? Or it it's, uh, uh, it's side effect free uh, program expressions. Labels include other labels? Yes. So, the, which actually turns out to be interesting in things like, say, provenance policies, where the, the provenance information is itself secure, so you might want to protect the, the provenance information with, it, with its own policies. So, before we can enforce an, an access control policy, the first thing we need to do is to be able to produce uh, high integrity user credentials in a way that these credentials can't be forged by another part of the application. So here we have a simple policy function that does a login. It takes two arguments, a username and a password. Uh, we check the password. And if this succeeds, we get a value of type user cred. And uh, the unique thing, the, the distinctive thing about a policy function is that it has access to these special operators label and unlabeled, which I'll show you later, that allows you to construct and destruct labeled values. So this label operator is applied to the user credential to produce a value of this form, user cred high. So this says that this is a high, high integrity user credential, and it can only be produced by functions like this, like, that have this policy qualifier on it. What else is special about the policy function? I mean, it's, 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 like what prevents me from making all my functions OK, so the policy functions are trusted. We have to verify that these actually do the right thing. So our proofs of, of uh, our encodings being correct actually have to analyze these to make sure that they do the right thing. So if you were to do that, then you'd have to prove that your entire program is correct. So the point is to keep your policy relatively small. What does it mean to do the right thing, though? So uh, for instance, in our, uh, uh, our non-interference proof for information flow, we have to prove that the policies actually propagate dependencies correctly. So with respect to us, sorry? In this case? In this case, uh, uh, that this is some trusted auth authentication function. Instead of just checking the password, you could do some uh, sig you know, signature checks or you know, whatever it is. So map it to your high level uh, notion of user, uh, user credentials. And you have to show that this actually does, you know, does the right thing. So for instance, if we had the, the label, uh, we produce a credential in the failure case, then, then that wouldn't be correct. So this is basically a human review item. Right, so item. yeah, it's a human review item that currently we, we, we have hand proofs that this works right. And I'm, we're at the moment working on a framework that allows you to compile these to 
declarations in Coq and allow you to try to do things semi, uh, you know, partially automated. OK, so um, once we have user credentials, we can then uh, define uh, an access control policy using this, this function access, which, is, uh, which takes three arguments. The first argument is the user credential produced by login. The second argument is an access control list. And the program, uh, the, the policy designer can instantiate this access control list with a list of user IDs, let's say. And uh, there's, and the data itself is data of any type alpha that's protected by the access control list. So this is uh, a dependent type here with the saying that the, the third argument is protected by the label that appears in the second argument. Uh, just like, uh, so, in the body, we check that U is mentioned in the access control list. If it is, then uh, as in the login case, there's, this, the, there's an unlabeled operator. So label and unlabel are the two operators that policy functions allow to use. That strips the label off of data and exposes a value of type alpha to the application. Yeah. Several um, questions here. So member. Who defines a number? Is that another policy function somewhere? Or? So it, it, it doesn't actually have to be a policy function because it doesn't rely on this unlabel and label. But in order to verify that, that access is correct, you have to know something about member. That's also code that's written. Like, this doesn't come automatically with the That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the, the intention is, in practice, this is not just a member check. It's a call out to some higher level policy that's you know, defining uh, user credentials. And maybe it's written in some trust management framework or something. Um, can I can arbitrary code now that's non policy code call this access function, right? Yes, it can. Right. So then, don't you have this standard problem in, in information flow, which is that once you unlabel the data, yeah. you can do anything that you want, right? So that's right. If the rest of the code is broken, then you're going to be in trouble too. Yes, so this is a simple access control policy in which we don't place restrictions on how information is used once, it's, once uh, access is granted. There are other ways in which I'll show you briefly that you can actually encode information flow policies in this that address this problem, that even though uh, arbitrary ac uh, application code can call this function, that we actually track flows throughout the application. So the point with this is that it's a really simple encoding for, for a really simple policy. And we think that's a good thing, that you know, it's a very common thing that you might want to try to do, and it has an almost trivial sort of encoding. Yes. How have you partitioned the text uh, based on colors? I, I meant to say this earlier, sorry. Um, the distinction is that uh, base types are in, in purple okay. and expressions are in green. So, exp so the, these expressions that appear in the types are, are, are distinguished from the base types themselves. So high user cred is some base type and high is an expression that appears in the type. It's a user-defined thing. So user cred is, is some way, so this could be actually instantiated to integers or to, to uh, public keys or, or whatever, you, so whatever way in which you want to enforce it for your language. And unlabel is an operator? Unlabel is a good an operator, yeah. Language keyword. Yes. And what is member? Member is just a function. All the green stuff is just function. Yes. Type int that's labeled with something. Yeah. Is the program allowed to read the bits of the integer, or does it have to unlabel it first? It has to unlabel it first. It must go via one of these functions to actually get it. Okay. So this is so the point is that the, is that this is really you know almost trivial. But the thing is, with something like this, you can you can begin to do interesting things. So uh, so suppose you had a program like this that was. Uh, that you know, there's a login that produces a user credential, and then you open files from the file system that gives you an access control list and a file handle. And the types here indicate that the access control list is a label, and the file handle is a file that's protected by that access control list. Now, suppose you wanted a, a way to read files out of this, uh, read strings out of this, uh, uh, out of this file handle. So we can give the library function read line that type over there. And this type is a little bit interesting. Unlike the, the type polymorphism we had earlier, this is a different, is a kind of polymorphism that we call 
phantom label polymorphism. So what this means is that read line is a function that takes a labeled file where L is any label and produces a string with that same label. And the L is an implicit type parameter that it doesn't actually have to be passed in at runtime or doesn't have to actually be instantiation, instantiated either. So, uh, or we can infer the instantiations, I should say. So if we call read line and pass in an FH as a file handle, at this point we can infer that the instantiation of L is ACL, and we produce a, a, a string that's labeled by the same access control list as, as the result. Next, suppose we wanted to print this string to the, to the terminal, then we can have functions like print string that have that type on it that say you can only print unsecure or unprotected strings to the terminal. It has a type string or a unit. And this uh, allows us to, to say if, if, if the program contained expressions like this, it said print string of line, uh, that's detected statically. And instead, the programmer has to, int has to um, interpose an access control check before actually printing the string. Uh, because this is dependent typing, we, we we get a little bit more precision as well. So you can uh, ensure that uh, the, the association between access control lists and the, and the data that they protect is, is always coherent. So for instance, if we had another access control list around and the application tried to spoof the policy by passing in the wrong access control list, then we can catch that as well. So um, that was access control. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about how we can do other kinds of policies as well. So information flow, for instance. So. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we don't require the expressions to appear in types to be values. They can be arbitrary expressions. So there's a framework of type conversions that we use to allow you to do things like this. So for instance, you can have a function plus that takes two labeled integers, L and M, integers that are labeled with L and M, and produces an integer that's labeled with the least upper bound of the two. And lub here is just a, a, another user-defined function. Uh, and then the type system can actually do these reductions. It can reduce an int lub low high to an int high to actually uh, and, and do this statically. So we can use this to enforce a static information flow policy. Uh, we can also do uh, dynamic enforcement via type refinement. So for instance, if we had a, a, um, a print function that, that had this type that said you can only print a, a string that has a low label on it, and we had some x that was labeled by some arbitrary label l, then we can reflect the runtime check of L with low in the type. So in the true branch of this if check, uh, we can actually prove that print X meets the, meets the requirements of the type. Okay, what's the refinement again? Oh, this, would, this refinement would happen automatically. If you did the policy check, then the refinement occurs. If you, if you did the label, if you did the equality check, then in, in the true branch, we refine L to be tr uh, low. You have to write this code by hand. You would have to do, you would write the if L equals low. Yeah. And the point is that, you know, uh, uh, you can use runtime checks like this to establish evidence that cannot necessarily be proved by uh, uh, type convertibility by the type system. So why do we choose this design for SE Link? So first is the, the first reason that all, se all security code is in a separate in enforcement policy. So uh, you know that to reason about the security of the entire application, you just look at the policy. And this also makes it easy to interface with some high-level policy engine. I mentioned earlier that you could call out to some trust management framework to actually do the policy checks. Uh, the type system is, doesn't know anything about security. It just uh, allows you to ensure that you have complete mediation and that uh, protected data is only accessible via the policy. And uh, with dependent types, it allows you to associate policy and data, and you can never break this association unless, without going via the policy. And this, this setup has allowed us to formalize it, and we've uh, proved that it's sound and that uh, uh, it's relatively easy to prove properties about our encodings. So I'm just going to give you a short flavor of uh, a, a small part of the static semantics of this language so that I can, that I can give you an idea of what sort of security properties we prove. So uh, the basic judgment is, uh, in a context gamma, an expression E has a type T. And uh, this judgment is parameterized by, by a context, a color C, that tells you whether you're typing policy code or application code. And we have a little bit of syntax, these, these circular brackets to delimit uh, policy code from application code. And what this says is that 
when you type the body of a, of a policy function, you type it in a context with Paul on it. And uh, this is a, this, we have to be careful that when, uh, that application code does not mistakenly gain the privilege of, of, uh, of policy code. So propagating these brackets around is a little bit uh, tricky. Uh, and then this unlabeled function has a, has a very simple rule as well. So uh, if you have an expression E with this T of E prime as a type on it, unlabeled strips the expression, the, the label off and gives you an expression with type T. So it's pretty simple. Uh, but that's all I needed to show you about this type system to actually state a little bit about this theorem. So uh, we formalized a property for access control that we call non-observability. And typically a, a correctness property for access control is quite, is, it refers to a, a, uh, a specific execution and is something like every access of a, of a function is, every access of some protected data is preceded by a call to an authorization function. Instead what we wanted to do is to have some kind of extensional property for access control. So, uh, the, so we have this property called non-observability that I'm going to try to state. Uh, I'll have to leave out a couple of the, of, of the, of the details, but I uh, hope I get the main point across. So uh, what this says is that there's an application program E uh, that's typed in an application context. That's what makes it an application program. And it refers to a Boolean variable X that's protected by some access control list. And then you have some user with a user ID that's not allowed to access X. So user is not mentioned in this access control list. Then what we can say is that if this user observes two executions of E, one in which X is true and one in which X is false, then these two executions are indistinguishable, that, they, that this is a strong bisimulation between the two. So this is quite similar to a non-interference property. In fact, it implies non-interference, but it's a little bit stronger. It requires E to treat X abstractly. That you, uh, that E gains no information about X at all. It's a timing, it's a timing and termination sensitive property. So uh, the proof of this property goes quite a lot like a proof of a, say, a value abstraction property for a polymorphic language. So uh, the distinction between this and non-interference is a little bit subtle, and I'd be happy to talk about this more in person later. Can you make the fact that the environment is containing else? That's right, yeah. So the, the other side condition is that E does not contain in, in itself some other policy function that lets it uh, strip off data in, in a way that you didn't expect. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and tell you about this, this document management system that we built in SE Links. So, uh, so SE Wiki enforces a, a fine-grained composite policy in documents. There's a group-based access control on fragments of a document, so you can associate policies with little pieces of documents. Uh, there's a provenance policy that tracks various operations in documents. So if documents are copied from other documents, we can, we can preserve uh, dependency information. If, if, if uh, uh, elements of a document are produced by computations, then we can track uh, uh, program slices to allow you to, to, uh, uh, to show you where this, where this information came from. And then we have this uh, cross-tier stack inspection policy where uh, it allows us to limit where information releases occur in the program. So, you're not allowed to actually downgrade information unless you're in the context of a privileged function on the stack. And our, comp our compilation technique allows this, to be encode, uh, allows this to be enforced in a cross-tier way so we can actually pass the, the call stack off to the database to enforce this policy correctly. A couple of screenshots from, S from SE Wiki. It's basically a standard wiki that has um, a lot of the no features that you expect. You could edit pages, search for pages, um, uh, and we have a tutorial up there that, that guides you through the features of this application. Uh, the interesting thing is that it has these uh, two kinds of labels, these access control labels and these provenance labels. And every page is associated with, you know, fragments of a page are associated with labels. So in this particular case, we have a fairly complicated label model in which over here we have a textual representation of the label. And this label applies to the entire page, but fragments of, of the document also have their own labels. Yeah. So the way in which we, we represent these documents in, in the programming language is using a value of this type. And this type is, a, uh, is a, basically an n array tree where the leaves are strings that store the content of the document. And uh, some subtrees are protected by security labels. So here, protected is a constructor that takes two arguments 
the first argument is a document label, and the second argument is a document that's protected by that label. So this is a dependently typed pair for the protected constructor. And uh, the, the point here is that doclab is just some user-defined type. There's not anything specific in the, in the type system that, ref that forces you to use doclab. Uh, but once we have, have data like this, we have to be able to store it in the database. That means we have to be able to store the labels themselves in the database. Uh, queries and updates of, uh, of, of the database must respect the security policy. And we want to do this in a way that bulk data processing is still efficient. We don't want to do everything in the server. We actually want to enforce these policies in the database. So um, the way we do this in SE Links is uh, we, start, we start by giving a type to a, to a table that looks like this where this is the type of, of, a, of the label doc table that contains label documents. That's the table name, and its type is a tuple. It's a three tuple where the first component is an ID, which is just a primary key. That's the integer. There's the second argument is a, the second field is a label. Oh, there's a typo here. This should be doc lab, sorry. Uh, and uh, that protects the data in the third column, which is a string protected by the second column. And so what we do is we have, we have uh, Postgres, the, the Postgres uh, database has a feature of custom data type extensions. So we have uh, extensions to Postgres that allows us to store SE links values like label in the database. And uh, now that we have a, t a type for this, for this table, we can actually enforce a policy such that queries of this table respect the labeling policy. So uh, for instance, so in SE links, the way uh, tables are viewed is as a list of tuples, and queries of the, of the table are expressed as list comprehensions. So suppose we wanted to write a query that selected all the documents from the, from, from the database that match a particular string, say foo. The way this looks in SE links is like this. So you have a, uh, a table declaration, LD, that's our label document from, from the previous slide. And then this list comprehension says that for each row in the, in the LD table, return all the rows in this part that match the where clause. Now the where clause has to be, is a little bit interesting because the data itself is protected. We can't inspect the data directly. We have to first call out to a policy function that grants us the privilege to access the data before running a regular expression check on it. So the way you write that is to actually inline a function call to access, passing in the user credential, the label, and the data that you want to protect. If this check succeeds, then you can run it, you can match it against the regular expression. So, uh, uh, this, we think this is good because whether you're accessing data, um, running queries against the database, or just doing other uh, actions in, in, the, in the program, you have this, it's the same model for enforcing the security policy. It's just calling a function at the right point. It doesn't matter whether it's an aware clause or anywhere else in the application. It looks the same. But um, in order to do this, we have to be a little bit careful that, uh, to get reasonable performance. We can't execute this entire query in the server. We actually have to execute this in the database. So our solution is to compile these, access, these enforcement policies, like access, to store procedures in the database. And then uh, SQL queries can call out to these procedures. And we have, uh, we have some experiments that show that we can actually recover reasonable performance using this scheme. It's about an order of magnitude better than actually enforcing it all in the server. So, and it also allows for uh, novel policies to be enforced. So it's not, yeah. So uh, one thing, my rough understanding is that uh, there's a particular property being checked that some function call must be made before some access to some data yes. is done. Yes. And you're checking this using uh, type system techniques, yes. right? Yes. So, um, so there are, I mean, it's, it's, it's not flow sensitive, right? I mean, what you have to show that along all execution paths where the access is done, yes. that the, the permission function should be called. So don't you, uh, we actually do that. We, we do check that on all, on all parts this function is called. I see. But uh, in, the, in the simple policy that I showed you, once you've accessed it, then you're free to do with it whatever you want. Once you get access to the data, then you, know, uh, you can send it to the adversary if, you, if that's what you want. So, but for example, let's say that there was a function that uh, for, for getting access that has two outcomes. Either the access is granted yeah. or it is not granted, right? Yeah. Then 
later on you try to access the data, then you have to keep track of the fact whether the access was granted or not. So you have to have some kind of flow sensitivity going on there, right? If, so the data is initially at a protected type, let's say int with a label on it. Yes, it's a functional language, yes. Oh, so actually, I see. I see. Okay. But even if, even if there were references, and you try, the reference had a label on it, so you weren't allowed to dereference it, and then once you did an access control check, you would, and it succeeded, then you would get a reference without a, an access control, without a label on it, and then you can dereference it as many times as you want. But if you wanted to enforce an information flow policy, then the policy does not actually return an unlabeled value. It returns a, a value that has a type with some label on it that, that tracks the flows. That say is the least upper bound of the labels that contributed to uh, constructing that reference. So um, I, I don't have a full encoding of an information flow policy on these slides, but we do have one in our paper. And I, I'd be happy to talk to you about how that actually works. So the way this, this uh, uh, so to give you an, a, a sh brief idea about how this compilation technique works, is that that, that list comprehension that we had on the previous slide that, uh, that uh, selected values out of this table is compiled to SQL that looks like this. So it's a, uh, it contains a call to a function, which is the access function, passing in values from the program. And then the access function itself is compiled to a stored procedure that looks like this. And, uh, uh, and the store procedure is in, is in PLPG SQL, and this call goes out to here. So it's, it has the same model as it would have in the, in, the database, in, the, in the server, except that now the access function is actually resident in the database as PLPG SQL. Okay. So, so much for the database. So we also have to worry about cl uh, securing client interactions. So right now, we have no way of, of, of limiting what code the client runs. So our restriction is that Label data cannot be sent directly to the, to the client. So we have a simple analysis that ensures that prior to, to releasing label data to the client, there is an appropriate policy check that goes out. Yeah. In the lang, so you have special sort of support in the lang, in the, in the programming language to access the database? Yes. OK. And so that way, you guarantee that you can't write a select that does not have that little access check. That's right. Uh, you, your queries are written in this list comprehension language that we type check. Right. That's right. Right. Uh, the, the other thing that's, that's, that is something that we're, we're interested in is that once you have functions like this that are in the database, you can associate this function with a view on the table. So all, suppose you had some other fun, uh, application that was going to access the table. It has to respect this policy as well. So uh, you, we can have some kind of protection for untyped check code too. So uh, about the client, so uh, we can't actually verify the client runs the code that we expect it to run, so we, we don't handle label data to the client. There's a couple of ideas that we're, we're beginning to explore that, that uh, use uh, cryptographic primitives to actually either encrypt or sign data before you send it to the client so that you can enforce confidentiality and integrity policies even when you can't trust the code that's run by the client. Uh, but clients can also attack each other, and this is where cross-site scripting attacks come in, and we have this beep technology to protect against this. So here's how cross-site scripting attack works in, in our SE Wiki application. Yeah. Is the first bullet, the point of the first bullet is that once the data leaves the program, um, that is it's sent to the web browser, it has to be unlabeled? Yes. OK. And so now we're going to talk about the fact that you have unlabeled data in your browser, and you might not want some other you know, app or something in your browser to read. So even if you have un only unlabeled data in your browser, an attacker can can steal labeled data from that he's not allowed to see. And I'm going to show you how that. Once the data leaves the program and, and goes to the client browser, yep. it is already unlabeled, right? So, so let, let me more protection. Yeah, let me show you this attack, though, that, that, that shows you how a user can, can escalate privileges using cross-site scripting. So uh, documents are like this. There's some top secret component and some secret component, but the top secret is purple. A secret user comes along, and the top secret portion is filtered out, and he gets just the secret component. What if this user turns out to be an attacker? You can insert a script into this part of the document that says, 
get the top secret component of the document, and reload the browser at evilsite.com, passing in this top secret data in the query string. And then saves these changes, and these changes get saved to the database with that malicious script in the secret component. A top secret user comes along, and now this portion of the document is not filtered out, it's over here. The script runs in the, data, in, in the browser, and the, the top secret data is forwarded to evilsite.com. So, uh, so we have to have a way of ensuring that, that, that these, either that these scripts never get saved in the database, or if they do, that they never get run in the browser. So the typical defense to this is to actually filter uh, content at the server to ensure that these scripts are never saved to the database. But this is difficult because parsing HTML is, and JavaScript reliably is very difficult. The malformed HTML is always is commonly accepted by browsers, and filtering this out is, is not easy. So our insight is that the, the right place to do this filtering is at the browser, so because uh, browsers detect JavaScript perfectly. So what we do is we filter scripts in the browser. So what we did was to customize a few web browsers to filter out cross-site scripts. And we have customizations for Safari, Conqueror. Opera has a way of supporting this without customizations. And we have some support in Firefox as well. And when passing an HTML document, the browser calls out to a special policy hook function that decides uh, if a JavaScript that it encounters is, is a good script or a bad script. And the browser loads the JavaScript only if the script authorizes it. These are relatively small changes to these browsers. So for instance, it's less than 1,000 lines of code in Safari. That's about 350,000 lines of code. I mean, can't the attacker put a hyperlink or a button or something in the, in the document that... That, uh, but... The data or but if you, that script in its query string would have to have some JavaScript to actually fetch the secret contents from the other part, from another subtree in the document. And so that script would never run. Even when you clicked on it, that script would not be allowed to run. Would an image tag be sufficient now? Right? An image tag tells you, go out, get this file. There's no JavaScript needed. But it's not get a file, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's get another portion of the same document. Which is a file which you can put anything you want to the query string for, a, uh, for, for an image tag. And then it would load, in, and then that image would have the top secret component in the top secret user's browser, which is fine, right? We want some way to actually get the component and then reload the browser and send the data somewhere else. As part of its uh, URL contained that top secret portion. I think that's what. Oh, so it's back Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. What do you, at, at Evil Site, you have a. You have a sort of fake image, so to speak, that as part of its URL yeah. has that uh, you know string which comes from a top, top but, secret source. But it doesn't have a top secret source. It wants to get the top secret source. So you have to have. I mean, there's no way to construct that URL unless you actually can do this, right? Right? OK. Uh, so we can, we can filter out these scripts in the browser, but uh, we still have to have a way of telling the browser what a good script is and what a bad script is. So this is where uh, the server comes in. So it's easy to, for the server to identify what a good script is and what a bad script is. So we have two ways of doing this. Either the server specifies a whitelist, which is a cryptographic hash of all the good scripts in the page or a blacklist where all the dynamic content of the page is sandboxed into a, into a subtree of the, of, the, of the HTML page. And uh, uh, the browser then checks to see that it, it, a good script matches the whitelist, or if it's a bad script. If it runs in that sandbox, then it doesn't, doesn't get run. And uh, we can show that, uh, we've shown that for the top 30 websites, we've retrofitted them with these policies, and the slowdown is 6% on average. The attacker from sending a uh, open uh, a, a slash div. Yeah. So this is uh, so the way in which this actually works is uh, I haven't showed the full encoding here. So essentially, there's a way of taking that uh, the user content, treating it as a string, and then assigning it to the sub to the subtree in a way that this splitting is not possible. There are details in our paper. There's a, there's a way of transforming this dynamic content into a string such that that's not possible. There's a feature called inner HTML in these DOMs that. You're just encoding it. 
Yeah, all browsers have this way of there are two modes in which they pass it, uh, content, either an XML mode or an HTML mode. And we can use the XML mode to ensure that this splitting never happens. For the example you gave before, uh, you would essentially blacklist the entire the entire wiki, the, the, entire the, user the user portion, yeah. Which will disallow any sort of script, whether it's top secret or secret or what have you. Yeah, in, in, so in which case you could use the, this policy instead. Instead of sand, if, if you want to have scripts that run in the dynamic content, you could use the whitelist policy to say, well, only these ones that are in the dynamic content are good, the others well, are bad. The server would have to know uh, that it needs to enable scripts of particular kind, particular sorts of users, which is kind of difficult. Yeah, but the server knows what script it needs for normal application functionality. Right, and then the rest is blacklisted. And the rest is blacklisted. Why don't you tell us about two policies? It seems like white is a simple way of doing it. Why don't you just do that? Why, why do you throw us into the complexity of what seems like a messier and less, less systematic approach? Uh, so to do, th I think a lot of pages are actually structured this way. So if you want to retrofit your application to do something like this, then that's the way to, you know, this would be an easy way to do it. If you're constructing your application from scratch, say using SE links, where you had some tool support to actually produce these, these hashes, then do it this way. Uh, the other thing with this is that uh, computing these hashes in JavaScript is a little bit expensive, so we have native support to actually compute these, compute these hashes. So um, it turns out that with these hashes, it's not 6%, it's more like 10%. So... It doesn't seem like it would be that bad for a legacy thing to just go through and you know, find all the JavaScripts and calculate the hashes from... Yeah, so we actually have a tool that does that, with, that goes over and, and produces these hashes. So. Uh, we just give you two ways of doing it, and the point is to say that there's, it's programmable, and th this hook is also just JavaScript. You get to do what you want to do. Yeah. I think catch the idea of the blacklist there. Yeah. So if there's any script that appears in this black, in this within the sandbox, when you're loading the script, the browser walks up the tree, and if it encodes, if it encounters a sandbox node, it says this is a bad script. I'm not going to load it. Make sure that I don't have any scripts in my pages to put my reads at the top level. Yes. Yep. Sure, I don't get any scripts. That's right. right. Yep. So, are there reasons why a static whitelist wouldn't be enough for the majority of applications? Uh, well, I think this is in general. You know, this is more general. So you could you could make this work for for, for all applications. You can if you can reliably identify all your scripts, then then that's good. That there are applications that generate script at runtime, in which case you have to update the whitelist. And there's perhaps, I don't know, maybe there's legitimate reason to have user provide scripts for an application like Facebook. Say. Yeah, and then if you were able to sanitize those scripts and, and figure out that they did the right thing, you'd add them to the whitelist. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, so but you know, so it's a trade-off. If the, if you had a way of of sanitizing, then you use it. This you you do that. Otherwise, if you don't, then you say you don't run the script. Yeah. Is the script in the whitelist closed, or can they call functions that appear in other scripts? So th that uh, so once a script is trusted, it's trusted transitively. So any script that it loads is also permitted to run. So this is something that could be uh, you know something that we might want to program. Has evals in it, yeah. So, so uh, there's, you know, there's certainly there's with more browser support, you could try to do things like rewrite these scripts so that they every time they do an eval, you check something as well. But the point of this was to say that with small changes, you could you could go a reasonable. So you can try to do things like jump into libc, make something trusted, and then try to you know, call into it. Yeah. yeah. So. More browser support. Uh, our point here was to say with small changes, 1,000 lines of code, you can actually do interesting things. But if you wanted to extend the browser or, or have a more programmable interface that allows you to uh, reduce this transitivity requirement. Is it reasonable to include the browser in the trusted computing base? I mean, you know, if I was NSA and you came to me and said, oh, all you have to do is add more stuff to the browser, it doesn't sound like we're, we're sort of proceeding along a path that's going to lead to success. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, but I mean, I think if you're trying to enforce rich policies, then forcing you to do it only at the server is, your, ha your hands are somewhat tied, there's only so much you can do. If you want to do rich things, then you need the browser to help you out a little bit. And right, the but, current... But, 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 you know, that's sort of a bizarre statement, right? I mean, the browser resides 
on an untrusted platform. Yeah. And you know, how, how do you know you can trust any aspect of a browser? Well, this is being used to protect a, the user. So if he wants to run a bad browser, then he ba you know, he's harming himself. But that's not the only scenario, right? I mean, you can imagine sort of in this Intellipedia that it's used to protect the information that the NSA doesn't want leaked. Right? And it's not protecting the user as much as it's protecting the owner of the content. In that case, you need the, the owner needs to take safeguards against it. So in that case, you would probably do more at the server. But the, I'm talking about policies that are intended to protect the user's um, you know, authentication tokens and the user's data. In that case, you can enforce it at the browser. Because it's in the user's interest to run a, a, a good browser. Remember this, the attack that he had, just there was a bad user? Yeah, yeah. And a good user, right? Yeah. yeah. And protecting, protecting the good user. Right. But there's another third, there's a third party in there, which is the one that owns the information that you also have to worry about. It's not just these two users that are involved in this. Yeah. I understand the scenario, in Sweden, but yeah, I just sort of. <laughs> I, I think I mean I agree. This is a this is this is tough, and maybe in this case you have to have some kind of way of ensuring uh, you use DRM to ensure maybe that the user the server ensures the user runs the right browser. But that has its own problems. It's not a bad idea because in some sense the alternative is that you write a custom client side display app for this kind of information, right? What, yeah. what are the chances that you're going to get that right? I mean, maybe it is good. To, to, to use something like a browser where you can kind of know where the scripting executions happen and just impact them. I don't know. Um, it's a, it is a hard problem, but I just sort of worry that sort of anything involves HTML and Java, it's really hard to be sure that you've caught all of the little ed rough edges. Yeah, I think that I agree. So, uh, so th that's pretty much it. I was just going to wrap up with some talk about uh, next steps. And uh, so uh, as we've been talking about richer client policies in some way, uh, either by using crypto or by having more browser support, uh, enforce other kinds of security policies. I think policy composition is an interesting problem that, uh, that you have to worry about. Um, can we specify policies automatically? I've been assuming that these labels are on documents somehow magically. Can we actually analyze the content of documents to come up with a reasonable initial labeling to say that this contains sensitive information and should be labeled high, uh, maybe using some machine learning techniques. Uh, apply Fable to other domains. So this calculus can be applied in, in, in other contexts, maybe retrofitting legacy apps or uh, OS level information controls. And then finally, some work that I've just started doing is to act, mechanize the meta theory of Fable to prove, have semi-automation in proving uh, that these policy functions are correct. Uh, so to wrap up, I told you about Fable, uh, formal language for, for enforcing user-defined policies. Links plus Fable plus our PostgreSQL compiler is SE Links. And we have some application experience. I've told you about SE Wiki. We also have this other application, SE Wine Store. Uh, that's our project website where you can try our demos and the papers that are on there. And here are some other projects that I've worked on that I'd be happy to talk about uh, in person later. So that's it. Um, are there further questions? <laughs> So the one thing I keep hearing from people who work on information flow is that it's, uh, they have to be careful about covert channels, that, that the access control mechanisms themselves can't be used as a covert channel. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, have you run into this, this problem with, with the labeling? Uh, yeah, so this work actually looks at that problem. So we, where if you uh, have access control checks that can modify the state of the policy, then you have to be worried about how you can leak uh, information about secret program data through the state of the policy itself. So, uh, uh, so I th these kinds of policies, this kind of enforcement in this language, Rx, can also be encoded in Fable. Uh, so uh, the point with Fable and SE Links is that it's a very just simple primitives, uh, dependent types basically, allow you to encode all these things. So we have yet to explore, actually implement an encoding of Rx in the system, but it's something that we'd like to try to do. So is, it, is it the programmer's job when they write um, these access control functions, like, like the access that you showed yeah. us, to, to watch out for these, these covert channels? Or? 
Yeah, so, it, so uh, at this point, we have hand proofs that they don't leak. Uh, they don't leak information through covert channels. But uh, ideally, we'd like to also have some specification of a, a security goal that we'd like to prove and then show somehow, maybe semi-automatically, that it does the right thing. How much work is it writing these policies and, and using SE links to kind of achieve the goal you want? So uh, writing the policies themselves, uh, uh, I think, are relatively easy. Uh, for the kinds of policies that we were looking at, the pol that's, that is not so hard. The, if you're trying to enforce access control policies where it's only an access control check and you don't care how the information flows once you're granted authorization, that's also pretty easy. When it get it gets hard when you have to do things like uh, uh, track information flows, even you know uh, through computations, and that is hard because you have to interpose these policy checks uh, at at these critical points. So um, uh, it's something that we're we're we're, we're working on in, in the sense that we'd like to be able to take a program and transform it so that it ins inserts the appropriate policy checks. And uh, uh, so it's it's not easy at that point at this point to be able to do. Uh, if, flow-based policies, but it's possible to do, and we have some experience doing it. So uh, we think that rewriting is a, is a, is a way to go uh, forward. Uh, could you compare uh, your work with the work uh, like GIF? Yeah, so, uh, so GIF, um, GIF bakes in non-interference and information flow policies into the type system. So if you want information flow, you have to buy into it you know, uh, all the way. So you have to care about it, implicit channels for uh, everywhere. So uh, m my perspective is that you know, there are certain critical parts of your code where you do care about information flows. And you know, maybe your, your crypto libraries or your downgrading functions. And th right there, you, you should probably have very precise information flow controls. But for the rest of your application, probably you, know, you should have some incremental way of constructing these things. So uh, SE Links gives you a way to start, say, with access control, have a basic level of security, and then to iteratively refine and, and approach uh, GIF style information flow policies for the parts of the code that you care about. And just to follow up on that, so I get your point about the inflexibility you can buy into it, but, but do you get any advantages from it being baked into that language? Uh, so I would say that, so GIF certainly is extremely powerful. Uh, there's another language that's called FlowCamel that uh, uh, also does bakes in information flow and does uh, uh, label inference, so you don't actually have to write down types. And a GIF does a small amount of label inference, but only uh, in a somewhat ad hoc way. I think if you were able to combine, you know, uh, bake in uh, label inference with, with, with GIF, you'd probably uh, get uh, best of both worlds and be able to write information flow applications with less annotation burden. But you'd still have to be very careful about uh, how you constructed your application because. Uh, you might not have to write down types, but you still have to program in this somewhat uh, difficult style. So um, you do get something by, by committing to information flow. But, uh, yeah. So uh, you mentioned the WP as a motivating example. Yeah. I'm curious if you've approach, uh, approached uh, people who are sort of in charge of it to, to solicit feedback on the practicality of yes. the techniques. Yes, we have. Uh, so, um, I don't have put in, I don't have clearance, so I can't really talk to these guys. But uh, but my, my my advisor does, and uh, so he's he's. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I can't tell you so much about it, but uh, <laughs> but I, and. Um, yeah, I suppose. I mean, so from what I so from what I've heard via my advisor. Uh, they really, you know, they, they really think that being able to do fine-grained access control is the right thing, and they want to be able to do this in, in some reliable way. They think that they would like to have more features, so things like RSS feeds and better searching and um, stuff like that, which we don't have in our application right now. So that's something that we're, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to build in. And uh, so in, uh, Mike is at least in relatively co close contact with Intellipedia guys. So. Browser? No, no, they don't have this problem because they have complete isolation. So you know, a, to a top secret guy can only see top secret stuff and just log out. Like it's actually they have maybe even separate machines on the same desktop that are that are connected to different systems. Copy down the URL 
grill by hand, tighten yeah. it into the open. Okay. Yeah, you could do that. If, if they wanted to use something with fine grain access control, though, don't they don't they have to worry about the? Yeah. It, in which case, it may, may not be too bad because within this, say within the CIA, you could require every machine to run a beep-enabled browser, and then you're okay. So there you, you, are, you know, uh, yeah. they, you know, whole history of multi-level security, you know, going back to the orange. Book, yes, like yes. So, can you do all of what they require by their standards for multi-level security on the same system? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, they certainly. I don't know if if. I mean, they, the Orange Book mandates a certain kind of enforcement mechanism as well. It requires operating system level separations and so on. So we're trying to say that you know maybe you you th those kinds of separations are ad hoc. That you could actually do it in the application and verify that it did the right thing and get the same properties. So in some ways, what we're pro what we're proposing is not in compliance with Orange Book because you can only verify it assuming that the behavior of the application and what it's running on it agrees with your model. Yes. I mean, the idea of the operating system is that you could verify it all the way down to the hardware, which presumably opens a whole other channel of attack. But I, I, I think I believe the, the Orange Book requires that um, that applications are not cleared to handle multiple classification levels. So we're fundamentally we're, we're trying to propose a new model in which you say you know Orange Book is is sort of ad hoc. We can give you the same sort of properties, but in a more principled way by letting you track information flows throughout the system. So maybe you do it in the operating system, and then you track flows throughout the application as well. My, my point was that your sort of your proof that, that you get the security right in an application is very much dependent on the application executing the way you expect it yes. to. And sort of since there are many levels of software below the application, yes, you can't really ensure that. Well, unless you can, yeah. Uh, unless you can verify yes. That. Yes, yes. Agreed. Yes, agreed. Crystal <laughs> <laughs> So you said like between the core subset of SE link sound was yes. outside this core subset that could be unsound or dangerous, I should be worried worried about when I use it. So uh, what we've proved is so this it's basically a, a dependently typed system F, uh, with actually uh, I, have, I didn't show you about show you this stuff, but it's dependent types with substructural types track state changes as well. So um, uh, we don't model this multi-tier thing at all. So this uh, compilation strategy to stick things in the database is just uh, is just systems work. We haven't actually proved that that our, comp our you know our compilation strategy is correct or anything. Uh, 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 the other thing that we have in model is that SE links has, or links itself has a sort of message passing model of concurrency, which is in a, uh, it's in the language, but it's not fully baked out. That's the direction in which the links guys want to go. But uh, so we don't handle that at this point.